start talking about the subject that we are here to discuss. Um, and yes. I think it would be great since uh, Courtney, you're our first guest today. I mean, <laughs> not today, like we're, we're going to have other guests today, but in general. And I think it would be best if uh, so we're, we will do an introduction before that. So we'll do a little bit part with uh, just with Yeva uh, talking about this and I will kind of introduce you then. But I think for now it's uh, best that you introduce yourself to the people that are going to be listening to this, if you don't mind, of course. Okay. Uh, okay, so hello, I'm Courtney Yasmine. Um, I am a woman who has spent her life trying to dis discover the best way to be creative. And I have discovered now uh, that the way I started out as a young girl of 10 years old, playing my guitar, carrying around my little journal, my little sketch pad, those things have become still the right way to live your life. I, for many times in my life, I thought those ways weren't good enough and I had to do things that were more professional or more commercial or more part of the rest of the world. And now I am, having the most happiness returning to my original idea carry around a book that i'm reading carry around a sketch pad carry around a journal carry around my guitar and, and make my things from scratch make my things from my own mind my own hands this is to me the most romantic life <laughs> but it's the best life Hello, I'm Courtney Asmine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. And um, so with this, I think we it was a great introduction. And since you started talking about your um, the ways and means by which you create and about, you mentioned a little bit, so, I mean, it sounds like you're a very, you don't create, you're not an artist in one way, you're an artist in many ways. We're talking about music, we're talking about visual arts, it's all a package. So, it, and you also mentioned, uh, conveniently enough for my first question, uh, the times when you were little and when you started your creative path. So could you tell us a little bit more about the starting point of your creative career, so to speak? Uh, my grandparents owned a very rustic place uh, near the border of America and Canada, um, in very deep woods and very, very um, primitive, uh, very beautiful lake in the great North Woods. And as a girl, very from maybe even three years old, every summer I was brought there and I was there the entire summer, but there weren't activities, there weren't other kids, there was no civilization. Um, and once a week we would drive into a town, a very small town of like a hundred people. And uh, my parents were well-educated, um, sophisticated people, but my mother's idea was that the summer was this beautiful time in the, in the North Woods. And she was an only child herself so she had this idea that you had to make the time for yourself. And she didn't really want to be bothered. I was safe. I had everything I needed. But I had really like no playmate and really no friends. And uh, 
I started by learning to use the canoe by myself with the paddle and go along the shore. And then I started bringing the guitar in the canoe. I bring the little notepad in the canoe. Uh, I would get out and I would pull the canoe by a rope and I would pretend it was a horse and that we were walking through the water. And everything was like this to me. And I just started writing little songs, little poems. I would always have the idea that when I went back to Chicago, to the big city in the, in the fall for school, that I would show my teachers the brilliant things I had composed over the summer because I always liked the teachers. The teachers for me were, I sort of, they were the people I lived for. So all summer I would think, oh, this is gonna be a good one. I'm gonna show this to the teacher when I get back to school. So that kind of gave me an audience for my compositions. So this was when, what, what was the first um, kind of, um, type of art type of creativity you you were so you were writing poetry and songs first yes and draw and also many drawings many drawings like folklore drawings of animals flowers woodland scenes many little drawings and many little poems many little songs Okay, I see. And so it sounds like um, you, as I think many other kids, were kind of creating your little reality within the one you you had around you and you were living in it and, I mean, taking your um, inspiration from it. So since today we will be t discussing romanticization, we, um, I, I would like to ask you um since it's uh we're kind of at this point where um i would like to ask you is is it is romanticization a part of your creative process and if it is what purpose do you think it serves you i have thought about this idea of romanticizing uh in order maybe to create something of beauty or meaning and i think that for me in every year in september i would go to the city of chicago and i would yearn for the beautiful woods the beautiful lake and the water the animals that i loved and I would be back in the city. Also, the other kids had not lived the summer that I had lived at all. They were part of baseball teams and they were living a totally different summer. So when I came back in the fall, my yearning and my longing was to return to the, to the woodlands and to return to the life. Of course, it disappeared anyway because it became frozen tundra. So it was gone all winter anyway. It was asleep, right? But the yearning of the beautiful summer and the feeling of freedom and the creativity, all these things stayed with me. I think that is the impetus a longing or a yearning to recreate or create for the first time something for yourself that you can't get walking around in your daily real life that is that's that, that's i think that's beautiful and um i would also like to um so um as i as far as i understood if i'll just clarify the chronological order of events so when you were little you used to come to um the cabin of your grandparents right for the summers right and then 
when um, I'm starting to talk a little bit about your first book, Girl Called Sydney. So then as you were a teenager, uh, this is, so the events that you portrayed in your book, um, they come from that time period and in the same location as the one you were talking about earlier, right? Yes. Um, yes, so, my, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we just want to listen to you. <laughs> uh, so my idea was that I knew that place and I had never stayed for the whole, a full year. And I, I decided that this was the answer to escape my family's, uh, my parents were getting divorced, but also my father was losing his business. So it was a complete disaster in the city. And uh, the obvious answer for me is, my God, this is my chance. I'm going to go there. There's nobody there. My family still owns it, but there was no one there. And I'm going to live there. And I'm going to finally achieve what I had all my life yearned for, which was to be like a North Woods woman. <laughs> you know, I loved it. I loved the idea. I loved it. <laughs> so if, if, uh, if we talk about the, the book specifically, um, if, if you were asked to briefly tell what it's about for someone who has not yet read it, what would you say it's, it's about? Well, I say that it's an um, adventure story based on my own coming of age story that I made it a character so that I, I could make it a very concise, simple version. And I wouldn't have to stick to many facts that were boring. I could make it about this girl called Sydney, and she um, she does a brave and exciting thing, um, born out of adversity. You see in the first part of the book that she has a very bad, um, very unhappy situation, which you understand is the only way a girl would ever go do what she did. Then in the second half of the book, you see her live through a winter in this isolated northern place in 1978. And uh, how she, I think, learns to see the rural people, the country people uh, who are not sophisticated like her family but in some ways maybe are better people morally. Um, there are things that she learns over the winter. And by the spring, she has had a wonderful serendipitous experience of finding a way to go on to get a, her education. And that's the end of the story. It's only the one winter. Um, so the very, so this story, the story, um, I think it sounds very romantic. And this is why I chose to speak about <laughs> it. Uh, because, you know, for some, for me, as well as for many other, I think, young people, or maybe even older people, the story of someone running away from home and someone living on their own independently, especially for someone who, um, for for younger kids who are still living with their parents and who long to finally break their these ties and who think constantly how how fun would it be to be on my own and i would like to ask you how do you think your experience with that how um you as someone who has gone through that experience um might perceive this romantic view on running away i mean um as opposed to 
people who are just thinking about it and reading about it and hearing songs about it? Like, how would that view be different? Um, I think that the most important ingredient um, about my story is that Sydney, like myself, was a serious person and she was trying to um, save herself in a positive way. Um, in one scene in the story, the bus driver drives out every day in very, very shocking cold temperatures. And he says, every day I say, she won't be here. There's no way she's come out to stand at this bus stop. And it's not even, there isn't even sunlight yet. And it's so brutally cold. There's no way she's standing there. And, and I, I always was, I always wanted to, to be there for the bus and go to the school. So I think that the ingredient that makes the difference between unrealistic dreams and doing something that is actually brave and exciting and possible is that you are still a competent, serious person. The example I will give is that uh, other, um, other kids from the town, other students from her school in the small town, my, when, my experience was that they wanted to come out to my cabin where I was staying so that they could party, do drugs, drink a lot, cause trouble, go crazy. And I refused to let them in. And I, I never ever uh, participated in this because I knew that my situation was life or death. And I couldn't take any foolish chances. So my idea about if you do something on your own, you have to be gravely aware of the seriousness and then you can take advantage of the freedom which is very romantic i love my story that story has given me many gifts now my whole life the fact that i did that set the tone for my life thank you for <laughs> I completely agree. Your story is absolutely amazing. And when I was preparing, when I was thinking about the questions that I that I'm going to ask you, um, I listened to. Um, I remember that on one of the shows, you played um, "Gone Away," and that was one of. It's probably my favorite song that you wrote, for obvious reasons. I think uh, because of someone mentioned there and uh, and because it just sounds it's it's just great so i was listening to it once again when i was preparing and um it led me to think about this next thing that i would want to inquire so um you are talking about bob dylan there so who was bob dylan to you in that time uh to me, when I first arrived to stay the winter, I really didn't know the recordings of Bob Dylan. I only knew the song Lay Lady Lay from the radio, and I didn't like that song. So I didn't really, I, I just thought, oh God, that guy, I, don't, I, I, I didn't like that song at all. Uh, but when I, came with the intention of staying the winter. Um, some of the boys who I played guitar with, they gave me Planet Waves, Bob Dylan's album, um, and Blood on the Tracks. And I then I immediately understood 
why his music sounded like this desolate, isolated, remote region that he had come from. And I really got into it. And it was a very romantic, I didn't know what Bob Dylan looked like. I didn't know how old he was. I didn't care. I wasn't imagining myself kissing Bob Dylan. I, it was just about the inspiration of the words, the songs, the life. I, it was the romanticization was about how he created himself. So, as you said, uh, he was, um, I mean, he was a vague figure when we talked, so you didn't know uh, personal details about him. Uh, but as far as I understand, like, as you, uh, who his image, like, what his image was to you. So, um, so what I wanted to ask about that is, uh, do you think it's important for an individual who is, uh, who is trying to make something of themselves and who is trying to maybe um, get through some difficult events in their in their life or just um, anything so do you think it's important for for an individual to have um, such a vague I would say if you allow me to use the word idol so do you think it's important for an individual to have that vague figure to, to look up to uh, and not necessarily know any specific det uh, details about them, but just for personal growth? I think that you have to have people, you have to be exposed to the artwork of people who have been very brave so that you can be inspired to act more bravely. I think that's what it is. I, I, I liked other artists. Um, I liked a lot of other music, but it was the way that Bob Dylan wrote the words and the way he used his vocal uh, interpretation of his words that I thought was um, it just extremely brave to not sound like Frank Sinatra. You know what I'm, who I'm talking about? Like an old singer who sang in a beautiful way. He, he chose, or even Paul McCartney from the Beatles, to not choose to sing beautifully, instead to sing like with all of your anger, all of your passion, and not try to make it sound pretty. It was a brilliant, brave idea to me. So you have to have someone or even maybe many people that you are watching who are making brave brush strokes or gestures or they're doing something that you can say, my God, it's possible. You have to be able to say that. Mm, okay. And if we talk about the profession of a musician itself, if we, um, for a moment, just talk about that. Um, so you're a full-time musician and uh, uh, there yes. must have been a point in your life when you were on the, if, if I can call this the receiving end, the audience, when you were sitting in the audience. So when you probably didn't know what it was like to be up there on the stage and you as probably, I, don't, I wouldn't make assumptions about you, but so many people, including me, were wondering what it's like up there and what do these people, we were all uh, like, I was watching films about musicians. And of course I had this idea of this, lifestyle that a musician has a very specific very very romantic <laughs> and uh, so yeah do you remember that image of a musician that you had before you yourself became one 
Yes. Um, I, uh, I wrote a song for, or oh, I'm going to check the screen is doing something weird. Upgraded for unlimited minutes. Okay. Um, okay, I'll answer. Uh, I had, I had met a girl who was, had gone on some dates with my big brother. She was five years older than me. Her father was the ambassador to uh, Spain. And she had come back to Chicago and she now was very romantic and very beautiful. And maybe she was um, 15 years old and I was maybe 10 years old. And she seemed very old and very glamorous to me. And she had been playing the guitar. And uh, this first idea of what a person looked like who was singing a song with a guitar, this was the very first idea, was this girl. When she came to our house and she picked up my little guitar and she sang and played, that was my first idea of my God, I have to be able to do this. This is incredible. And so she taught me my first chords and I became obsessed with trying to do what she had done the one night that she came to our house. Uh, I'm going to add that many years later, when I was in college, um, I was living in Minneapolis and a great singer who was not a songwriter, Linda Ronstad, you can look up her singing many beautiful songs. Um, she had come to sing in a giant, giant arena. And I rode my bicycle there from my college and I didn't have the money to go in. I don't even know why. I just was like, oh my God, she's in there singing. And I rode my bicycle there and a man was selling tickets outside and he said to me, do you want to buy a ticket? And I said, no, I don't have, I don't have any money. And he said, all right, here. And he gave me the ticket and I locked my bike and I ran in and she was standing in this completely filled place. And I was just ran in and I was just standing. I was just wearing like shorts and a t-shirt and I had been riding my bicycle and I stood and I watched her sing this song called Desperado. It's a very famous song uh, from her time period. And I, my whole brain had like fireworks and I felt like I was standing facing her and she was standing facing me. And I thought, my God, how do you get from here to there? How the hell do you, could, could anyone ever get from here to there? That's what I thought. Well, <laughs> you're there now, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it reminds me of this um, Alice through the looking glass thing where you're on the other side of that, of that mirror. It's, so I'm gonna <laughs> pass a virtual microphone <laughs> to Yeva now, and she will have a set of questions for you as well. I'm just gonna make a little technical remark here. So uh, we have like, there's a limitation. We only have 40 minutes for one meeting. Uh, so when we get just kicked out of the meeting, I will just call just like I did before and then we'll just continue. And Yeva, don't turn off your recorder, okay. please. <laughs> During that time, okay. Yeva. Mm -mm. Can okay. you? Yeah. Can, yeah, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So as our as the topic of our episode, our episode is romantic 
romanticism and romantics and artists and the effect of this intellectual movement on people. I want to start my questions with something that you have already mentioned. So uh, romantics are, sometimes they are character, characterized, okay, one second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes people characterize romantics as people who rebel against training and against people telling them how to acquire certain skills and they sometimes they just don't want anybody to train them but you have mentioned earlier that you loved teachers so in my question i want to ask what is your idea on training and on people telling you how to master your skills okay this is a great question um I think that it has to be a balance for an artist. Uh, if you listen to everyone, and many people won't like your idea for your original style, and you listen to them, like poor Bob Dylan. Poor Bob Dylan, many people didn't like his style. So think, I'm so grateful that he didn't listen to them. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to have some people that you respect who can give you either training or help you learn a skill that will enhance your ability to bring out the fullness of what you're trying to achieve. My idea personally was that I I did uh, sing in the choral groups in choir as a child. I performed in the church as a child, singing by myself on Christmas Eve uh, for the whole big church when I was only eight years old, um, singing a Christmas hymn. And I had a very romantic idea about this. I was in the balcony, I was wearing the white little robe. I had a candle made with a battery and I got to sing across all the people. And I, I thought that was great. And I did it the way they wanted me to. And I sang exactly the way they, the, the director instructed me. But of course, that's just singing, uh, a very traditional song and to become original to be have your own style you have to go a long way from that little girl standing with her candle to being a person who writes their own songs and their voice is recognizable as a very distinct voice so somewhere along the way you have to take training take good advice take good skills and then somehow find something very unique of your own. Thank you for your answer. And it's so great that you also mentioned Bob Dylan and the fact that he has faced uh, pressure from society and criticism of his work. In my next question, I want to ask um, if you ever felt this pressure and if you can, can you describe the feeling that you got from it and how did it affect your later work and working process in general? Yes, I, I always had, uh, I always had a feeling of people pushing my, pushing away, pushing me away. Uh, for my my self expression, my mother, if I would get out my guitar, my mother would say, "Oh, do we have to hear this now? Do I have to go take an aspirin?" Because she would say immediately she would get a headache if she had to listen to me. So all from the very beginning, there were people saying, "Ah." Oh, 
we can't listen to you anymore. We don't want to listen to you. Um, and then that proceeded through every phase um, of my life. In my early 20s, I thought maybe I could become a professional musician. But people had so many discouraging things to say about the way I looked, about that it was all in that time period and there was a lot of talk about women about that you weren't pretty enough you weren't thin enough uh your voice wasn't beautiful enough um and i just hated all of that so i would always take my songs and my guitar and go home and just be like okay forget it world you don't understand me. You don't want what I have to offer. Nothing I do is good enough for you. So you can all go to hell and I'm going home. This was definitely every, at every phase there was this feeling. Um, for some reason, I do want to say, for some reason, the longer I have uh, stayed and just said, you know what, you're going to like this. I'm going to get better at it. I'm going to do things that are the most, make it the most understandable, the most uh, appealing that I possibly can. And I promise you, if you stick with me, you're going to like it. Now with that attitude, I feel I've been able to stay, stay in the public, stay with my connection to people, just continue every day saying okay well maybe that wasn't that wasn't my best but maybe i'll do it this way this time and i just stay with the world i stay with the people and i don't give up and go back home anymore because i feel that there's enough that's good about what i have to offer and that it's original enough that i'm just going to keep doing it and I get better at it the more I do every single aspect. I think that I think that's the way to go. It's a great attitude to life. And I think it's a great thing to not give up at a very difficult period of life. And in, and because of that, because of something that you have mentioned, I want to ask, um, what do you think was the reason that you have changed your attitude? As you have mentioned that you thought that you wanted to close away from the world and from the society, but then you realized that you have to continue. How did you come up to the idea that you have to continue? Because so many people don't come to, don't reach this point that they just have to stay for a little longer. Yes, I think, I think the main things, one, is that every other way of life I have tried. I have been a mother, of, I raised my three children. Um, I have been a teacher. I have worked in advertising and marketing. You put my brain and my skills to these other tasks. And this is the, only thing I like to do, as I said at the very beginning of our conversation, what I like to do is go around with my guitar and a notepad, and I like to dress up in the clothes that I think are fun, and I like to interact with people, and I like to sing. And I have decided that since it's the only thing I like to do, I just have to keep finding ways that I can do it and that it also connects with the world or with other people. So it's really that I don't want to do anything else. So I might as well just keep really making this as great as I can. It's a great and very inspiring answer. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also <laughs> coming back to our uh, topic of romanticism, uh, one other characteristic that is uh, 
very romantic is that people who tend to be romantic, they usually embrace bravery and spontaneity and this very fast pacing world. And sometimes they are very bad at finding some beauty in very simple and mundane daily things. So do you think you can still, even though you had such a great life, so full of so many brave and exciting things, do you still find those beauty in simple things? Yes, I think actually uh, for someone who I, I formed, I formed the basis of who I wanted to be on this idea of a um, very primitive, simple life. And so to me still, um, when I am invited, for example, to be the artist in residence in the summer, last summer I was invited, to go to northern Minnesota again, go to the North Woods. They gave me my own little cabin. They gave me a canoe and uh, I got to per perform a concert for the people and give a talk about my writing. And I knew that this was the, the very best thing of all is to actually return to the most primitive, simple thing and say that you know that, I guess, I guess I would add to the romanticism at this point in our discussion, uh, an element of the, either the mystical or the spiritual, whichever word you like to use, a word about the unseen value of your life, and those things are, you can feel that when you are singing to a thousand people and they're all listening to your song, but you can feel that when you are alone in your own bed and you're so glad to be home after many weeks of traveling and you're laying in your own little bed with your blanket pulled up and you're saying, I'm so glad to be back home. These are very primitive, simple feelings. And I think they might be the most romantic feelings of all. It's a great addition to the definition of romanticism. And to, um, to sum up a little bit at this point, so because I have my final question, and before I ask this, I want to say that um, during our talk, I have noticed that there are so many characteristics of you that are very similar to true romantics. You are very brave. You have done many great, brave things in your life. You embrace nature and you are, uh, you have a lot of emotions and you're very artistic. And those are the characteristics of romantics, but some of them um, can be harmful for people when they don't understand how to deal with this. For example, as you have mentioned that you left your house, that if you are not serious about this, it may not end up well. So my final question is, do you think, uh, how do you think harmful can romanticism be for people in Genia, for young people, and how does romanticism affect their development? I think that if you have a vision for your life that's grounded in um, in a in a deep sense of like a calling, like a sense of what you, what your destiny is, or of what your best thing that you can offer the world. If you are grounded in a, in a vision that's somehow meant to be like the word Dharma, 
the D H A R M A word of a, yeah. a work, a work that that defines your life. Then it's about work, and it's grounded in a seriousness, um, and it's also the grounded then in humility of how can I be of service? How can I be of help? How can the world use me to make the world better? And if you ground yourself that way, then it's not about fame and fortune, or it's not about uh, just like beauty and fun. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's based in humility. Yeah, thank you very much. And that is it for me. But Dasha has her final question for you too. So thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, I would like to ask something that is personally I have I have been through that phase and Courtney remembers, I think you <laughs> you might remember it. Um when I was saying that oh i was born in the wrong time i should have been born some some time like a long time ago specifically <laughs> i had a specific uh, number of years so this is one of one of the characteristics of romantics to um, one of more the ones that to my to my opinion um are from my experience uh, more harmful to the one who has that worldview uh, to not appreciate the things that you have and to think that some something some places that you're that you're not in are better or some or the times that the times before you or the times long after you were or would be much better and you wish you could be there so what what do you think about this point of view and um did you ever yourself have that moment that you wish you would from some image some some bright and attractive image of something else to wish to be somewhere else or to live in some other time period yes uh in the recent years my in just the past two years my big brother died and, and when my my brother died I had suddenly a very strong yearning to go back to the old years when Bob Dylan was young, when my brother was young, when I was young and looking at those guys as the cool guys. Um, and I knew all that music from that time period. So I started singing again, many old songs and last year i made a record of almost all old songs and then my one song gone away about my own time during that time period so it was like i wanted almost to completely go back to 1978 um and i sang all these songs in my concerts for about a year and i talked about my brother dying and I tried to recapture this for myself. And it appealed to many other people too, to hear these old songs sung with tears in my eyes and they would have tears in their eyes. But at this moment, I would say that I'm bringing that with me, but I have a very strong desire right now to say new things about what I have just witnessed, what I have just been through, things that I see now that our society and our culture and the songs, those old songs that I love, they, those things weren't being addressed yet. There are new things that we are addressing now that are very important, that are new, that are shiny, that are exciting. And I feel like I'm bursting with new ideas 
about what a woman like me can say to the world now. And I feel that my next concert, when this is, when we're finally able to give concerts again, I feel that my new concerts have to have this element in addition to the wonderful nostalgia and the wonderful romanticism. I feel that I have to say some things that are born of the time now and the adversity of now and the new less lessons. We have new lessons that have to be expressed. Thank you. That's, um, that's a very, very interesting outlook. And for just to, um, to make this nice closure and to maybe connect with some of the listeners of our podcast, um, for those romantics out there who think that some other times and places are better than the ones they live in and who are in constant sorrow <laughs> and desperation over that. Do you have any recipe for such people to how, how to find the enjoyment in the present, in now, in the moment? Yes, I do. My idea is that you get out your sketch pad and you get out your journal and you carry your notebooks with you and you carry your pen with you. This is your freedom. These are, this is your key and this is your door. Your door is your paper and your key is your pen and you escape through this. And you also you write the note in a bottle. You, you write and you roll up your paper and you stuff it in your bottle and you throw it off the side of your ship like a pirate. And you say, here's my experience of what's happening right now. My individual expression. And by doing this, you make this moment as romantic as all, all of the past of our humanity. And you have to do it. I mean, if you're alive, this is your gift. Your gift is that you get to express yourself. I could not agree more. And I thank you very much for, for the recipe of, of happiness for those hopeless romantics out there. And I, again, I can't, as, as I was listening to you, I once again thought that I'm so happy that you're the one that we're talking to on this subject because your, your view on it is very unique and very, um, I mean, it's very understandable and comprehensible for me. And I'm sure it will be the same for the people who don't know you personally, but who listen to this. And thank you very much for sharing this with us. And we are honored to have you here as our first guest. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I would do this anytime with you, Dasha, and with Ev Yeva. Yeva, am I saying it right yes, now? Yes, yes, great. Okay, with Yeva and Dasha, I will always be happy to be a guest. Uh, both of you have brilliant outlooks yourselves, and by the questions and by the way you phrase it, I know that both of you carry the same values and the same heart that I carry. Well, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to meet you and to talk to you in such a form. Thank you very much.